Welcome. My name is Steve Dubin. I'm the host of My Generation, a podcast sponsored by South Shore Senior News. South Shore Senior News is a monthly newspaper and digital product that reaches out to seniors throughout the South Shore and uh, the Sandwich Generation and service providers who uh, work with them. Today, we have a special guest who focuses on uh, one of the challenges of aging, which is grieving. And um, Susan Dravich Kelly runs two different uh, grieving uh, classes. One is called Grieve Not Alone for those who have recently typically lost a spouse. And then secondarily, uh, there's a, a another support group called Riding the Wave, for those who still want to have a support for ongoing um, dealing with grief. So welcome, Susan. Thank you for joining me today. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, so tell us how you came to, to doing this uh, for others. Well, actually, uh, it's probably two main reasons. Uh, one is my own personal journey with grief. Um, I have experienced four profound losses in my life. My brother, my mother, my father, and then my significant other. Um, when that happened, it was actually during COVID. And I reached out to my local community, um, to my church, and to the senior center here in Situate, and discovered that there was no grief support groups. I, I um, navigated the journey of loss and healing from my brother, my mother, and my father on my own. Um, but when, when I suffered the fourth loss, which was a different kind of loss, um, I really felt like I needed some support, um, although I have a fabulous family and friends. Um, it was during COVID and I just felt like, you know, there is a need for this. As a professional, I've always um, coached people through major life transitions. And I thought, gee, uh, why not apply all of these skills and experience that I um, developed uh, and accumulated over the last 40 years of my professional life and um, and and use it to help people that are navigating through a huge transition, which is the loss of a loved one in their life. Um, that coupled with my father, um, who uh, was huge on volunteerism and Anyone that knows me knows I talk about it all the time. He really placed a high value on giving back. And I was very fortunate to be successful in business. And uh, he literally made me promise him um, in his 95th year of life that once he was gone, that I would promise him that I would stop working for profit and just give back. And so to me, I've always, since his passing in 2014, I've always done a major volunteer project for the community I lived in. So um, this was part of honoring my father's legacy as well. Okay. And so your support groups uh, run out of situate? Right. So I approached the director of the Situate Senior Center. Um, I am on the board and I'm the vice chair, so I have a close relationship with her. Um, you know, we meet almost weekly um, and I approached her and asked if she would um, support me in this from the viewpoint of providing a place and helping me with promoting, if we can use that word, which is an awkward word to use for grief support groups. Um, at the time, we were in the midst of COVID. Um, so when I started this program in March of 2021, 
when I launched it, I launched it on Zoom. And so that was a really challenging first year because it was the first year for the program. It, I literally started with a napkin <laughs> of ideas and um, and I had a Zoom account for my business anyway. So I just ran it on Zoom. Once we opened up the brand new senior center here um, in June of 2021. So for the second year, I was able to move it into a uh, an on-site uh, program at the senior center, and uh, they provided me with a room and marketing support, if you want to call it that, administrative support. Uh, but I do all of the program creation and facilitation and all of that at the Citrus Senior Center. It's free. I do this purely on a volunteer basis. And um, it's open to anybody that lives on the South Shore that wants to come to the Citrus Senior Center. Okay, and typically, two two questions: How large is the group? And then, secondarily, um, the first group, grieve uh, not alone. There's some structure to it in terms of number of weeks as well, right? right? So the grieve not alone was created for recent grievers and. Um, it's a very structured workshop uh, program where um, it's an interactive workshop program. I don't do, I don't talk through the whole thing. I do readings. We do interactive activities, partnering and sharing within a group. But it's a 16 session program that starts in September and runs through May. And we meet um, twice a month on the first and third Thursday of the month. And then I also made arrangements with the dining hall, dining room at the senior center so that with Grieve Not Alone, after we have our one and a half hour session from 1030 to 12, we then go as a group to the dining room and they have a table reserved just for us. And then we have we share a meal together after each session. So that's very unique. And it's it, it, I, I found it to work extremely well to help with making people form bonds with one another. Um, the second group, which I started this year, this has been going on now for four years, Riding the Wave is for continuing grief. Um, we meet on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Um, in the afternoon from 1 to 2.30. So that group, they're used to how this all rolls because most of them graduated from the Grieve Not Alone. So organically, they organized lunch together before the session in the dining room, and then they come. And that's, it. there is structure to it, um, on various topics, but the topics are derived from the needs of the group. And there's more of what I call sharing and caring either within the group at large or with partners. The Riding the Wave group is larger. I cut it off at 16 people, which is really a lot of people. Um, so I do a lot more partnering or small groups of three or four uh, to work on different concepts. Uh, the Grieve Not Alone is a group of 10. Um, and that's, you know, that's about the size. You know, we try to keep it at 10 to 12 people because they're in a different place in their grieving process. Okay. And so... Um, I thought we might talk about some of the myths of grieving, grieving right? Um, I think until you're grieving, you're, like many things, you don't really understand or have the a real empathy for what it is. Um, and not once you're there, you, walked, you don't know. What, not you, until you walk the path. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, um, and so let me start with. Uh, you commonly hear people refer to the five stages of grieving. Um, do you find that there are five stages? Well, there are, so there's a big misconception. I mean, the five stages of grief was developed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, 
through her research, uh, she worked with cancer, people that were diagnosed with terminal, that were terminally ill, diagnosed with cancer. And she actually studied how they, their end of life experience was. And she was the one that actually developed this model. Since then, there's been many other models, um, but that's sort of the classic one. And one of the things that I try to emphasize to all of my um, grievers is the fact that they may, this is not a step-by-step -step handbook of, you know, if you go through the five stages of grief, um, that once you get through the five stages, you'll be better. Um, a lot of people don't realize that grieving and healing is not a linear process. You don't go from shock, you know, and denial to anger, to regrets and guilt, uh, to, you know, severe, profound sadness and loneliness and depression to acceptance, and then you're all done. It's I describe the grieving process as a big tangled mess. And so you, some people may not pass through all those stages or experience all of them. Um, and some might, and sometimes you might feel like, okay, I, I'm not, I'm not angry anymore. And then suddenly something will happen and you'll be experiencing that again, which is called backsliding. So it's really, um, it, it's not a linear process. It, it, that's probably one of the most important things for people to realize. The other thing is there's many other models that we talk about in the grief support group. There's another um, you know, expert called, his name is James Miller, and he describes the grieving process through the seasons of the year where we start in, you know, autumn, and then you get into the winter of grief, and then you get into the spring and ultimately the summer. And I, you know, so I also weave that in, and it helps people with imagery to understand what they're experiencing. And there are, we could talk for hours, there are many other models, but the, the key point to realize is it, any one of these models is not a step-by-step -step handbook. It, I wish it was that easy. I, I tell people that all the time. It would make healing from a major loss a lot easier if you could just go through the steps and then you'd be all done. Um, unfortunately, it, it's not that simple. So these are models to help people understand what they're feeling and what they're experiencing physically and mentally and emotionally and cognitively and spiritually, but they're just models. And everyone's grief is unique to them and only to them because they are the only person that had the relationship that they had with the lost loved one. So if somebody loses their spouse, even though their children may be grieving, the grandchildren might be grieving, the siblings might be grieving, and other family members, no one's going to have the same grief experience as the, this main person because they're the only ones that have that relationship with the person that passed away. Okay, thank you. And um, what about uh, the concern that you come across of, uh, I find myself crying all the time, or conversely, I find I can't cry at all. Uh, and in both cases, they come to the conclusion, is there's something wrong with me? Right. And that's, you know, again, grieving uh, affects us emotionally and physically. Um, and crying is a natural part of grieving. Um, I have had people in the group each year that have expressed that they haven't cried and they think that there's something wrong with them, that they're not grieving correctly. Or I have people that are crying every day um, and they think something's wrong with them because they can't stop crying. And the reality is that 
with healing from grief, you have to embrace all of the emotions that you're feeling and you have to experience them and you have to accept them because if you try to skirt around them, it's not going to be helpful in your healing process. Now, having said that, if, you know, five, you know, two years later, somebody is still crying every day, all day long, then there are other issues that need to be addressed professionally. It could be that somebody is really experiencing depression, which might need to be treated professionally. But in general, it's really normal for people to cry a lot when they've lost somebody. And again, grief is a unique process. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. However you grieve is how you're going to grieve. What you're feeling is what you feel. So if your family or your friends are getting frustrated with you because you're crying all the time, um, they just need to get over it because it's normal. Okay. All right. Um, and then what about, you know, uh, talking about my loss only makes me feel worse or only make it, or, or it really makes me feel better. What's your take on that? Well, that's really one of the values of being in a grief support group. There are people, each year I've seen this happen, where somebody will come into the group and they'll come for maybe one session or maybe two, and then they leave. And nine times out of 10, <laughs> they're not leaving because they're suddenly healed after attending one workshop. It's usually because they don't feel comfortable talking about their grief. And we, I create in the room that we have, which is dedicated to the grief group, um, I create what I call a grief container for the people coming into the workshop. And it's a safe space where people can feel free to share and care. Sharing is important and caring about the other people that are sharing is just as important. So um, when you're sharing, you're sort of taking your feelings out of yourself and putting them out there. So it's almost, it's creating an environment where people have to experience what they're feeling emotionally. And some people don't want to do that. They feel they think that if they don't e experience the pain, the pain will go away. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work either. And so for the most breathing, I tell people breathing is a hard and difficult process. Breathing uh, the loss and healing from the loss is work. It's hard work. It's not easy. And part of that work is learning to take everything that's inside of you and get it outside of you, either through talking or journaling, a combination of both. And so that's the magic that occurs within a grief support group is that you're sitting in a room with a group of people that are all hurting as much as you are, and they're going to understand how you feel. We listen to each other's stories over and over again, and it's okay to tell your story over and over again. Family and friends don't want to hear the story over and over again. And so I, I think it's, it, it is a huge myth that if you if you don't talk about it, if you don't feel it, then you don't have to go through it. And that's why I have people that come into the group at four or five years later or eight or nine years later because they did try to just, you know, avoid feeling what they were feeling and thinking that it would get better on its own and discovered it's not. And so we have what I call delayed grief or unfinished grief. Those are two really common phenomena that occur. And so 
you know, a lot of times people come into the group and they're almost apologetic that they're showing up eight or nine years later. But you know what? I'm thrilled to have them because they finally have recognized they do need to talk about it. They do need to to go through it. You can't go around. Okay. And then I think, um, you know, part of the the process is people um, sort of move forward with their life um, in all kinds of ways, whether that's a new friend, a, a new love interest, a new job, a new house, whatever it is, but they may feel very guilty about that, um, that they're leaving behind the person that they were grieving. Thoughts right. on that? Yeah, um, and that that's really common too. A lot of people feel, a lot of people express fear that they're going to forget the memories that they're going to forget their loved one that they're they begin to feel guilty that they can't move on and moving on could be something as simple as laughing again or going to a movie again going out to dinner with a friend i mean it can be you know, moving forward can be a, a baby step like that that can be really challenging. But um, I always remind people, what would your loved one say to you? What would your loved one want for you? And of course, they begin to realize that their loved one doesn't want them to be sad for the rest of their life. And, you know, it's I read, you know, it's really amazing every year when I bring a group together. I mean, the first couple of sessions, it's like everybody is quiet and sad and crying. You know, I have Kleenex boxes spread out all around on the different tables. But then all of a sudden a session will occur and somebody will say something and the group will start to laugh. And I'll just stop the group and say, listen to that. You know, you can laugh again. It is okay to laugh and you don't have to feel guilty about it. So, yeah, I mean, guilt and regrets and would haves and should haves and could haves, that whole package is one of the stages of grief that people will keep revisiting as they process through the healing journey. And it, that's common, but it's okay. And it, it, it takes a lot of work and time to move forward. And, you know, that's like a whole nother part of it. I mean, acceptance is the fifth stage, accepting the loss and life without your loved one. But there's actually a sixth stage, which David Kessler, who was Kubla Ross's protege and has carried on her work, um, he actually felt strongly that Kubler-Ross did not mean for acceptance to be the end of the healing process, that there, there had to be more to it. And he created a sixth stage, which is called meaning. Finding meaning and purpose in your life without your loved one. And that's a lot of what we focus on in the Riding the Wave group. The Grieve Not Alone group really focuses on I, sort of bringing them through all of the stages leading up to acceptance. And the riding the wave is focusing in on that sixth stage is finding meaning and purpose in your life. Okay. Learning how to laugh again without well, feeling guilty. That is a really uh, positive point to somewhat end this interview on. Um, can you recommend other resources um, for folks? Sure. So, you know, besides uh, our senior center, um, I would, I mean, just really simply, I would encourage people to contact their own senior center um, that may have a grief support group, um, contact the local churches in the area. There are many churches that host bereavement groups that aren't some of them are really faith-based but some of them are more ecumenical um uh, for example uh jonathan pierce 
um, just accepted a position as a community program manager at the Second Parish Church in Cohasset, and he's going to be launching a bereavement group. Um, there's another group called New Beginnings at St. Francis Xavier in Weymouth. Um, the South Shore Hospital also has a bereavement support group, and they also have a whole department that can refer people to services and support, whether it's private grief counseling, which some people need in conjunction with group support, two different experiences, sitting one-on-one -on -one with a grief counselor um, is very different than the group dynamic and both are valuable. Um, the Norwell VNA also provides um, bereavement services. They do run a group. It's more of a drop-in group. Some of my people have gone to that. Some people find it helpful. Other people find it difficult to be in a group and then keep having new people come in. So it would be like, you know, you can imagine people coming in that just experienced a loss and then you have somebody else who's in their second and third year. So it works for some people and it doesn't work for others, but they, they you know, they have uh, valuable resources there. Um, there's uh, Hope Floats down in uh, Kingston, um, for people that have lost a child, but they also provide um, private counseling. There are a few people in my grief group that do go to private counseling there, which is helpful. And there are a few others. There's uh, a, a bereavement uh, support program in Plymouth, which is the Cranberry Hospice. Um, and so they are similar to the Norwell and then also Old Colony Hospice in West Bridgewater. So Again, to contact your local, you know, uh, DNA hospice organization in close to your community. Most, all of them have bereavement um, support services. The other thing that a lot of people don't think about is that many of the funeral homes also have bereavement services. Um, I know here in Situate, our local funeral homes do. And so a lot of people don't think about going to a funeral home to get grief support, but there are some that provide bereavement services. Hey, wonderful. Well, that was a really good um, sort of around the globe South Shore summary. Um, and how do people contact you if they'd like to check in um, directly? Sure. Um, probably the best way is to send me an email, which would be Susan, S-U-S-A-N, at S is in Susan, D is in Drevich, K E L L Y dot com. So it's Susan at S D Kelly dot com. Right. Well, thank you very much for being on with us today and sharing your insights and your experience. Mm -hmm.